There are a lot of opinions regarding the last presidential election in the United States. Everyone seems to think they know who would fit best in a position of power. The expectation of an elected official is that they use their power to do good in the world and hopefully right some wrongs. But sometimes we elect wicked people who make the world a little more horrifying. In March of 2011, Arkansas State Representative Justin Harris and his wife Marsha were looking to complete their family of five through adoption when they received a phone call from a distraught mother. The woman's three daughters were in the foster care system after her boyfriend had repeatedly sexually abused the eldest child. Social workers and friends warned the devout Christian parents that they weren't the best match for the traumatized little girls, but Justin used his political influence to force the adoption. Just weeks after being in the home, the Harris family was convinced the girls were possessed by demons and that the two youngest could communicate telepathically. The oldest girl, age six, was removed from their home after only a couple of months, leaving the two youngest, ages two and four, behind. The baby roamed the house freely, while the middle child was locked in her room for hours without toys or clothes, all while being monitored on video cameras. The babysitter could bring the imprisoned child food and water, but was instructed to not socialize with the girl. The Harrises even hired a professional exorcist, but nothing helped and eventually they had enough. Justin and Marsha rehomed the girls with their longtime friends Eric and Stacy Francis, but the girls' trust was broken yet again when Eric sexually abused the four-year-old not long after. The two youngest girls were legally adopted by a new, loving family, and the oldest is reportedly thriving in her separate adoption. Eric Francis is behind bars for the next 40 years, but the Harrises have yet to face consequences. Juan Ronaldo Sanchez served as Fidel Castro's bodyguard for 17 years and came to worship him like a god, but in 1988, on a warm day in Havana, Cuba, Sanchez's illusions came crashing down. Sanchez claims Castro had an affinity for betraying those closest to him. After directing an allegedly government-run cocaine operation and housing a smuggler, the United States became suspicious. Castro launched an official honest investigation and manipulated the court proceedings to frame his loyal colleague of 20 years, Jose Abrantes, to pay for the crime. Abrantes' firing squad execution was filmed at Castro's demand, and the tape was played in front of his entire staff, including Sanchez. After, the bodyguard officially retired but was thrown in prison and tortured for several years for knowing too much. Castro was also responsible for the deaths of thousands of his own citizens, in addition to violating their human rights. After taking away religious freedom, due process of law, freedom of press, privacy, and easy access to medical care, according to the Cuba Archive Project, Castro was responsible for 10,000 deaths, using his own power to kill men, women, and children for opposing or trying to escape his regime. Juan Sanchez escaped to Miami from his Cuban prison cell and wrote a book chronicling his time as Fidel Castro's bodyguard. In November of 2016, Castro passed away, and many celebrated the death of a man who had killed so many. President Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan left his vice president, General Abdul Rashid Dostum, in charge while on a business trip to Central Asia, a man the president had once regarded as a killer. General Dostum was, at one point, investigated for participating in a mass killing involving both civilians and prisoners. Violence was in his nature. During a game of Buskashi, General Dostum tracked down a political rival of three decades named Ahmad Ishi. Dostum's men took turns beating Ahmad with their fists and AK-47s until he lay bloody on the ground. Dostum put his foot on Ahmad's throat and threatened, I can kill you right now and no one will ask. 
Dostum and his men kidnapped Ahmad and brought him to his home as a prisoner. For five days, Ahmad suffered at the hands of his rival and his men, claiming they all tore off his clothes, beat him frequently, and raped him with the barrel of a Kalashnikov rifle, which later caused him internal bleeding. General Dostum was issued an arrest warrant and had his home surrounded by police, though he maintains he is constitutionally protected from prosecution. However, according to President Ashraf Ghani, his alleged crimes will be fully investigated. Illinois State Representative Keith Farnham claimed that as a child he was sexually abused and assaulted, but it seems he carried on that legacy by breeding more abuse on innocent children. On March 13, 2014, federal agents raided Keith's home looking for incriminating documents when they stumbled upon a plethora of child pornography. Police found 2,765 images of children in sexual situations, some as young as six months old. In addition to email exchanges and chat messages with other pedophiles discussing the lewd fantasies and experiences they'd had with children, Farnham described how he sexually abused a six-year-old girl before having sex with her mother, which he claimed was a mere fantasy. Another message read, 12 is about as old as I can handle. What I really like is 6, 7, 8. Keith stored the child pornography on computers and several state-owned external hard drives. While collecting these images, he ran a campaign encouraging parents to monitor their children's internet activity. He was even featured on a coloring book handed out to children to teach them about cyber stranger danger. Keith Farnham was sentenced to eight years in prison, though it's unlikely he will see any time behind bars as he is 68 years old and was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis and bladder cancer and has a short life expectancy. January 13, 2009 started off normally. Mayor Gary Becker of Racine, Wisconsin went to a suburban Milwaukee mall to make a few purchases purchases that later landed him in jail. Gary Becker, husband and father of two, had been chatting online with a 14-year-old girl, or so he thought. He made plans to meet up with the girl and take her to a hotel to, in his words, have lots of fun. First, he dropped by the mall to buy her special lingerie, nine pairs of Junior's bras and panties. It was here where Mayor Gary Becker was arrested by the undercover cop who had posed as the girl he had been chatting with. Just a month prior, Gary made the mistake of asking city workers to fix his personal computer. The technician discovered pornographic images of girls he believed were well under age, along with over 1,800 sexually explicit chats from Becker. Gary Becker was sentenced to 114 years in prison and was fined $370,000 for second-degree sexual assault of a child under 16 and possession of child pornography, among many other charges. However, he was released three years later under GPS monitoring and is not allowed to have contact with minors. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte is wreaking havoc on his citizens. What started as a crusade against drugs has turned into an outright killing spree across the country. Duterte has run an unrelenting, violent campaign against drugs, urging police to kill any suspected users. The violence from authorities and vigilantes has caught many family members and friends in the crossfire. Five-year-old Danica May Garcia was getting out of the bath when attackers came for her grandfather, shooting her with a bullet through her neck and killing her almost instantly. Duterte calls these dead children collateral damage and has yet to back down from his malicious war, recently passing a bill that drops the criminal age from 15 to 9 years old. The president has said he would kill his own children if he found they were involved with drugs and has likened himself to Hitler, saying he would be happy to slaughter 3 million drug users. Rodrigo Duterte is still in charge of the people of the Philippines and shows no signs of stopping his violent regime anytime soon. As of 2016, over 8,000 people have been killed as a direct result of his campaign. 
Kim Jong-un has taken after his father, Kim Jong-il, in more ways than one, but it is his execution methods that stand out on the list of inherited traits. Many family members and top officials in Jong-un's inner circle have either gone missing or have been killed. He called his uncle factionalist filth after executing him for interfering in his decisions as the new leader of North Korea. Jong-un also had his brother, Kim Jong-nam, killed, hiring two women to smear VX nerve agent all over his face. Within 20 minutes on the way to the hospital, Nam passed away. In large doses, XV nerve agent can cause convulsions, loss of consciousness, paralysis, and respiratory failure. But Jong-un's preferred method of execution utilizes military-grade anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, and flamethrowers. During the official mourning period of Kim Jong-il, a military officer was caught drinking and was sentenced to death. A short-range mortar firing squad carried out his execution, according to one source, leaving no trace of him behind, down to his hair. This is the only glimpse into the horrific reign of Kim Jong-un. Of all the people his father left to guide him as a ruler, very few are left alive today, and he's made it clear even those closest to him are not safe from his cruel and unusual punishments, and neither are his citizens. Jails are known for being overcrowded with prisoners incarcerated for everything from theft to murder. People like Judge Mark Chavarella put criminals away, but in this case, the judge became the convicted. Mark and his partner Michael Conahan concocted a plot to wrongfully put away children in privately owned juvenile detention centers in order to turn a profit. One of the over 6,000 victims was Hillary Transu, who created a MySpace page mocking the assistant principal at her high school in 2007 and was later locked away for it by Mark. Other children were convicted for things such as stealing a jar of nutmeg or even trespassing in a vacant building. Most of the time, they didn't have attorneys and had to defend themselves. The scheme brought in $2.8 million, which Mark and his partner Michael happily shared. Both men were charged and convicted for their crimes, and the former judge will be disbarred from the system and serve 28 years in prison. As for the 6,000 kids wrongfully imprisoned, they are likely glad to see him on the other side of the bench. Kremlin critics are a specific group of people who work to expose and bring down corrupted Russian government. Unfortunately for them, the government seems to be taking them out one by one. There have been numerous deaths of political figures, journalists, liaisons, and influential citizens, all critics of President Vladimir Putin, and all dying under suspicious circumstances. In 2012, a member of the Kremlin critics who exposed the Russian government's tax fraud was out for a jog when he dropped dead. At 44 years old, he was in great health, but the police didn't find his death suspicious even though there were traces of a rare and poisonous plant in his stomach. In 2006, ex-KGB and Kremlin critic Alexander Litvinenko met with a couple of men who would help him incriminate the Russian Mafia. However, the meeting ended with Alexander in the hospital, dying from being poisoned by a radioactive substance known as plutonium-210. Though no evidence has linked him and no official record exists, there is a strong suspicion that Vladimir Putin and his regime are behind the murders. In Mother Russia, it seems any slight against its leaders is a mark on your life. Teodoro Obiang Ngema Mbasogo is Equatorial Guinea's longest serving leader. In 1979, he overthrew and murdered his uncle Francisco Macias Ngema after discovering his plans to kill his entire family. Obiang had the chance to improve life in Equatorial Guinea, but instead became the worst dictator that Africa has ever seen. Though Obiang has committed corruption, electoral fraud, and money embezzlement, he has remained in power for 38 years. Perhaps his most disturbing claims are that his power comes from eating his opponents. One purported victim was a police commissioner who was found buried without testicles or a brain. Others claim he skins his rivals alive and eats their livers. 
Obiang claims to have godlike powers and believes he will never end up behind bars or in hell because he is God and it is God who gives him his strength. Equatorial Guinea's communities are some of the most deprived in all of Africa, despite their president living an extravagant lifestyle. The downfall of Teodoro Obiang would mean the end to so many oppressions and injustices, but bringing a tyrant down is easier said than done. Thank you for watching. Now be sure to press on another video, and of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel because you won't want to miss what's next. And if you'd like to help keep creepy content on YouTube, please find my Patreon linked below for more information. And I'll see you next time.